Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and welcome to episode 50, everybody. Thank you for being part of this journey. I really appreciate every single one of you tuning in. And today is a very special episode because I've got the opportunity to interview Dale from Delectation of Tomatoes which is a local seed company here in Utah. Now, Dale has got an amazing selection of seeds that are available. And during our interview, he shares so much with you guys, so much um, different tips on growing your garden, handling pests, um, dealing with uh, heat and UV. There's just so much that we go into. So I don't want you to miss anything in this episode. So you might want to grab a pen and some paper to take some great notes. Dale has also been very generous with an amazing giveaway for you guys. So please stay to the end so you know how to get hold of uh, what it is that he's given away and learn a little bit more about it. Um, But without further ado, let me give you a little bit of background about Dale. From an early age, Dale has been fascinated by nature, by the diversity of living organisms and by ecology. After completing a few degrees in zoology, tropical ecology and forest resource science, Dale has devoted 20 years to research and management of endangered species, primarily as a professional ornithologist, but also working extensively with plants and many other animal species in the U.S., Uh, across 20 different states. Dale has also taught college courses in the biological sciences part-time for several years and throughout those years he also pursued his avocation as an avid gardener. Dale returned to Utah for work back in 2008 and took an eight-week class called Grow Utah Farmers Direct Market Track which changed the course of his professional life. In February 2011, Delectation of Tomatoes was established as a sole proprietor business entity essentially as a way to legitimize the gradual process of a hobby taking over a life. I hear you Dale. Now the audio quality on my side is not very good during this interview because I'd forgotten to plug in my microphone so my apologies for that but you guys should be able to hear Dale loud and clear during this interview. So without further ado it is my great pleasure to welcome Dale from Delectation of Tomatoes. Dale, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know that you uh, are super busy um, this time of year. Like there's, there's so much going on in the garden. I can only imagine what it's like for a small business dealing with seeds. So can you tell my audience just a little bit about uh, what you sell and the services you provide at your company? Yes, uh, first of all, I'm glad to be here, Emma. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, Delectation of Tomatoes is a small company I started back in 2011. It was just a hobby. I never intended it to take over my life, but it has in a big way. Um, (laughs) I started out hoping to share all these wonderful varieties with my neighbors by doing CSAs. Um, which is a weekly box or basket of of fresh produce. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll just sell to my local neighbors and they can bring their wagon or their wheelbarrow over and they won't even have to use a car and they'll get all those wonderful fresh veggies for six months of the year. Well, I didn't get very good reception from my neighbors. I lived in West Valley City at the time and I ended up with customers from uh, different parts of the valley. Anyway, um, over time, I've uh, focused less and less on fresh produce and more and more on producing seedlings in the spring and seeds year-round. And uh, I've been active online and gardening forums from around the world, and I've collected 
a few few varieties of seeds. Um, now I have about 3,500 varieties of seeds in total. Oh my gosh, just a few. And, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, most of those have come from other gardeners who who have been seed collectors. And they offer to trade seeds from me based on what I posted on my website. And I've never been very good at saying no to a good thing. <laughs> and so my hobby became an obsession, which kind of took over my life. And now I focus primarily on seeds and also on seedlings. And if I have a good year, then I have some fresh produce that I can offer as well. So out of those 3,500 varieties, uh, about 2,300 plus are tomato varieties. And the foreign countries from which I have traded seeds uh, are primarily Russia with uh, about 375 varieties. Oh, wow. And Italy with perhaps 75. And then it goes on and on, probably representing at least 30, 30 countries that I've traded Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. Like, and I mean, how many of these do you grow out typically a year? Well, that's the rub. That's the challenge. I've moved five times in the last five years. And so I'm growing in other people's backyard gardens and leasing property from the county and just kind of hodgepodging everything together. And so it's hard for me to plan from year to year. Um, hopefully I've settled down now. I just moved earlier this year. That's really um, interesting, though, that you were able to, um, you know, source land from somewhere else. Because I know, you know, a lot of um, my listeners are very new to gardening. And some of those challenges have always been, oh, I, I don't have enough space. And it, it sounds like you got really creative to create space for yourself. Can you kind of share a little bit how you made that happen? Yes, it's mostly been um, relatives, siblings, and cousins. And it's involved sometimes traveling up to two hours to a garden where I'll go to one place for about a, uh, five or six days and then come back to another place. I have grown in as many as eight different places. Uh, sites in one year wow. so there's been a lot of traveling involved and um, it's been other farmers and like I said leased property through a, a program in Salt Lake County and um, backyard gardens of places I've rented and um, now I'm on a place with that about 0.3 acres so I can put in about a uh, maybe a 6,000 square foot garden and I'm hoping to put a, a high tunnel on there later this year. So yeah, it, it's a challenge and it's certainly not efficient. It, it leaves me with much less control over the soil and mm -hmm. makes it really hard to plan when I'm essentially an itinerant farmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm hoping to, to correct those problems here in the next couple of years. Yeah, and you're you're not alone. I know I've got friends up in Canada who have um, a community garden plot, and that rotates and changes each year. It's going to be a different site, a different soil. They don't know, you know, what the previous people have done with the ground. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a potluck um, for them. And I know some of the community gardens and allotments in the UK, they they kind of have the same kind of deal where they're just kind of rotating. Uh, people through and around so I can imagine that's that's really challenging so I think I've I've been living in my house for four years now five years oh my gosh I can't remember I must be getting old yeah. um, but um, I, I think I'm just getting a grasp on growing here in in Utah and then like you know the I mean we had a really late snow this year I don't know if you had it the same um, but we had like snow in in June um, which was really unexpected and I've never had that before so that was kind of interesting and you know I, I assume that you've got some of the same kind of climatic challenges as what I have as well. 
Yeah, I've I've grown um, in South Central Utah, Southeastern Utah, in Western Utah, in the Delta area, uh, mostly along the Wasatch Front, Utah and Salt Lake counties. Now I'm in Eastern Utah at 6,200 foot elevation. So our last frost was on June 9th, oh. and um, I'm expecting frost within six weeks or so here. And uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> kind of scrambling and trying to figure out how to protect my plants because I got a pretty late start this year. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there are some unique challenges growing in the high desert, especially in the basin of the um, of old Lake Bonneville where you've got that dense alkaline clay. You know, mm-hmm. great minerals, but poor drainage and high alkalinity. So, you know, I'm sure as you've discussed, you, you've got to you've got to add a lot of organic matter and you've got to get that pH down and get the drainage up and get a lot of, um, you know, really care for the soil and, and, uh, you know, get some earthworms there and some leaf mold and whatever you can to improve the soil. And, you know, after a few years, um, it can be really, really good soil. I wish the place that I, um, moved from in West Valley City. It was our family home growing up. And, you know, I still remember the day that we dug up the, the lawn in the backyard and, and started a garden back in the seventies. And, um, I wish that I had, <laughs> um, taken about three dump trucks and filled them up with mm. that topsoil that we worked on for all those decades because it oh, was. Yeah. It was like gold, and now I'm starting from just bare desert soil, and it's it's a challenge. <laughs> so, so what have you kind of done to kind of um, sort of get over some of those challenges in your current location? You mentioned compost, and I'm a big fan of compost. I think I would compost anything and everything if I could. Yeah, um, years ago I had a compost pile that started out about 10 foot diameter and six feet high with tons of leaves and, you know, kitchen scraps, garden scraps, all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. It's um, thermogenic, you know, at a point where it was about half that size. And I put six to eight inches of compost on my garden the next year. And that was the best garden I've ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm starting to compost here, but I don't have a lot of materials yet. So I forked out some serious money for uh, some garden soil. It looked pretty good from a local Mm -hmm. um, hardware store here, about seven yards of it. And then I added about two parts native soil to one part garden soil. And I'm growing in grow bags right now um, because I want to put in a high tunnel. I can't grow stuff where I'm going to be working on a high tunnel. So I've got my garden off to one side. Well, I'm trying to work on taking down this giant Siberian elm tree. And I mean, that's a lot of details, but I've got to get that tree out first and then level the ground. And then um, I was actually thinking the other day, Emma, that are you familiar with the product called Nutramulch? No, I'm not. Tell me a bit about it. Okay, there's a company in Moroni, Utah, kind of near central Utah, Mm -hmm. and they work with Norbest Turkey Farms and with a, a, what do you call it, a timber mill. Mm -hmm. So they take the litter from the turkey and the shavings from the from the lumber mill, and they blend them in a, a, a carefully controlled environment up to I think it's 165 degrees to kill the bacteria and so on yeah. and then they package that up and you can buy neutral mulch at your local at, at your local IFA or other places you know by I think it's one and a half uh, cubic foot bags maybe two two cubic feet I don't remember anyway um, I've been to their place and I'm thinking of ordering like a tractor trailer full of I mean it'd be very very expensive but I've, you know, it was recommended to me from a guy that worked at the Salt Lake County Extension Service years ago, mm-hmm. and I've had good luck with that and with others, but since it's a local company, which I'm in favor of supporting, yeah. and, you know, it's a couple hours from here, but, man, if I could get that to recharge the soil, that would be so good. I mean, 
there's other ways to compost, but it's so expensive. And, and I want to get with the town here and see if I can collect about a thousand bags of leaves and run them over with a lawnmower and put some grass or something in with them to get them composting and yeah. get my leaf mold and you know if if you do it right you can have earthworms growing and reproducing and they're all winter long yeah and have really good stuff the next spring or especially a year and a half you know if you compost that compost that for a year and a half you got some black gold <laughs> you, no you, you really do and you kind of touched on something really important there and i think you know we overlook so much about you know getting things locally but by using those local resources you know you're not um i mean you're not you've got some level of carbon offset from all the shipping costs and things right um and also you know you're supporting local businesses as well and you know, I mean, honestly, like, for for my garden, you know, compost was always the best thing. But, you know, I, I had co-workers who had um, horses and stuff, and, you know, they, they couldn't pay people to take away, um, you know, their manure and stuff. And, you know, I'm just like, I'll muck out your horses if I can have it for free. And, I mean, it was some of the, the best compost, and it was the best garden like year that I had because I had the soil right and because the nutrients were there because I've got super sandy soil so it loses nutrients really really quickly if I'm not keeping on top of it oh yeah you know that 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 manure can really help with the gardens but you know one caveat I'm sure you probably talked about is uh you need to know where that that manure comes from mm -hmm. and you need to know what those horses and cows are eating yeah. um, some of these modern herbicides can pass right through the cow or the horse especially mm -hmm. and stay in that manure and essentially destroy your garden for up to four years yeah yeah so your, your plants won't grow because they're all broadleaf um, weed killers basically yeah yeah, yeah. It, yeah, I've had customers, seed customers have told me some horror stories, and I'm like, I'm just not willing to randomly go get somebody's horse manure unless yeah. I have some assurance that, that they don't use herbicides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point, Dale, and thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah, I think I was very lucky with my co-worker because she was a gardener, and she was kind of very organic orientated, and you know, she she knew, um, you know, what went into her horse's feed and where it came from. And that's, that's kind of a rarity nowadays, I think. Yeah. Use lots of horse manure if you like to pull weeds. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's the bane of my existence. I don't know about you, Emma. Um, not not some, well, some weeds, certain <laughs> weeds. So bindweed is, is a big problem in in my yard and um you know actually in, in my neighbor's yards and things as well and you know i feel that the more you pull that up um the more it grows back um i'm pretty sure there was like a horror movie or a sci-fi movie with that where things kept multiplying and keep coming back like that's that's what i feel i'm dealing with <laughs> hey i'll write the movie script you contact the people in hollywood and we'll have a blockbuster right Right, right. I mean, I'm no good with names. You know, Revenge of the Killer Bindweed. No, that's yeah. You know that bindweed? They've documented it can live up to 50 years from the roots, and those oh roots can go 10, 10 feet down. So it's a it's a losing battle. But you know, if you keep on top of it and just keep hacking away, they get slightly weaker and slightly weaker. But yeah, yeah. Bind, bindweeds. Ah. Oh. It's good exercise, though. You know, I, I get out there with the hoe or I'm pulling it by hand and I feel, well, at least I'm getting some exercise coming out and, and doing this. But it's it's true. Like, the more that you kind of pull it, you do see it less and less. And I found using um, thicker mulches and things have helped. Um, but, I, I mean, I've in my garden, I have um, that plastic weed barrier fabric stuff. And then we have um, the wood chip mulch. And because the wood chip mulch started breaking down into this really lovely nutrient-rich um, stuff, 
it all started growing in there too. So that that was a little um, frustrating. <laughs> I mean, it yeah. has flowers that the bees like. So um, you know, that's that's a bonus. Um, I know that you you kind of mentioned um, you know when we were kind of talking um, offline um, earlier that you know one of the the issues that you had was a lack of pollinators. Um, can you tell me a little about that? Yeah, I live in a small town and on the edge of town, and so um, on the back back the south side here is just native vegetation, you know, sagebrush, rabbit brush, and so on. And um, I have not seen a single honeybee. Nobody else. Well, there's a few other people at garden, but there's almost no fruit trees in it. I've not seen any high tunnels or greenhouses in the area and no orchards. And so it's just kind of a little town built up in the desert. And um, I do see an occasional uh, native pollinator. I've seen, a, a, a you know, every day or so I'll see a bumblebee. Mm-hmm. Maybe a couple of mason bees and, you know, uh, some wasps and other things. I, I haven't collected them to identify them. But mm-hmm. but even on, on, like, basil and other plants that should have tons of pollinators, there's just none. And mm-hmm. so one of the things I want to do with my hike tunnel is, is devote about a quarter to a third of it to native vegetation and to ponds and you know, put some, have a frog pond in there, or, you know, some western spadefoot toads and maybe some salamanders and some, uh, snakes and, and all, and all kinds of native vegetation and pollinators and put out some, some, uh, structures for mason bees and other native pollinators mm-hmm. and have lots of wildflowers that will attract pollinators and kind of have my own little oasis here instead of all just straight commercial you know, money driven, make as much money as I can on as little property as I can. Yeah. I wanted to have a, an, kind of an aesthetic appeal too, but especially just the rich biodiversity. I mean, my background, as I've mentioned, is as an endangered species biologist. Mm-hmm. And I've always enjoyed being out in native areas and seeing lots of, uh, lots of biodiversity, lots of different kinds of plants. I mean, I've just seen some beautiful places, and, you know, the more diversity there is, the happier I am, and I think the healthier the 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 soil is, the less problem you'll have with insect outbreaks or other diseases, you know, just a lot of, of biodiversity, and I've started doing that a little bit with my plants here this year, where I'll, you know, put a couple of tomato plants, and then some pepper plants, and some more tomatoes, then some eggplants, and then some basil, and, and so on. Just kind of interspersed things to, to, uh, you, you know, I, I, I remember the first time I, I'm sorry if I'm diverging here, but. Oh, you're fine. This is great. Yeah. I remember the first time I flew on an airplane back when I was like 19 years old and I flew over the Midwest and I'd already had some ecology classes and so on in college. And I remember looking out that airplane window. And I was stunned as I flew over the Midwest to see this quilt uh, network, this mm-hmm. quilt checkerboard pattern of beans and corn, beans and corn. And, and then when I did research um, sometime later on the ground and actually worked in the soybean and the corn fields for my profession, um, they are ecological deserts. Mm. biodiversity is almost non-existent they basically spray herbicides along the roads so there's no weeds and then everything else is just one crop and it it just makes me so sad I mean it's green and it's productive but that's not the kind of, of farming that I want to do I want to I mean oh oh I just my brain goes all over the place I'm sorry <laughs> This morning, I put um, some bird netting over. My front yard is entirely cucurbits, melons and squash and cucumbers uh-huh. and such. And they're starting to produce, and they've got blossoms. And I want to keep the birds from eating my melons and so on. I was out there this morning stepping on top of my netting, and I had this hummingbird come from across the street where they have some flowers. And it came right up to me. I mean, literally three or four feet from my face. 
Oh my gosh. People was talking to me and I was kind of like that. <laughs> and and I'm like this uh this I I'm I don't want to get mystical about this, but um it was like this bird was talking to me cuz I had seen it trying to get to these blossoms and it mm-hmm. couldn't because of the bird netting. And it came up to me like it was upset. <laughs> and I just you know, I'm not I'm not an animal whisperer or mind reader of <laughs> birds or anything like that. But it occurred to me that, you know, it'd be the decent thing to do to let this hummingbird have access to my blossoms. So I took the bird netting off. I've only had it up for a few days. I mean, that's maybe a little crazy, but yeah. just an anecdote. No, I, I think that's, that's beautiful. And, and one of the things, you know, that I, I've certainly seen, you know, obviously I've, I've come from the UK um, and I've visited various countries and states you know, all over the world in, you know, the the time of um, my career. And I've, I've seen some, you know, really interesting places. And, you know, one of the things that I, I really miss from the UK is, you know, the, the hedgerows that they have um, between the fields because the hedgerows are just so full of, you know, different things, you know, whether it's blackberries, gooseberries and, you know, sloes and all, all these wonderful things. And then you have all of these, plants that are flowering and they're just kind of alive with birds and bees and you know part of uh, my garden where I've got my squashes growing um, I had um, a bunch of sunflowers that self-seeded and I was going to pull them out and then I kind of decided not to because um, we lost our beehive um, this year with the winter which was um, really sad um so you know I kind of left these sunflowers and things up and you know one of the things that I love to do every day when I go out um after work is just kind of watch the bees um you know pollinating and doing their thing and I've now seen these little finches um you know kind of going nuts for the seeds that are on them um which I didn't really expect because it's not you know they haven't really all gone to seed or anything yet and it was kind of funny to sort of watch them all kind of chirping and, you know, they'll be getting cross with each other. It's like, hey, you've finished eating. Come on, it's my turn. Um, and then they notice, you know, there's like a giant person there trying to film them and then they fly away. Um, but, you know, it's, it's it's beautiful to just kind of take a moment and, you know, watch what's going on in the garden and, you know, kind of, you know, take that moment to, you know, in, enjoy what's what's happening around you. Um, so that's, that's really lovely. And, you know, I mean, for you, there's, there's just, there's not a lot that's, that's out there. And, you know, I think a lot of people can connect to that because they, they, you know, also live in kind of these mini deserts because most people in, in a subdivision, I mean, I'm just kind of peering outside and almost all my neighbors have grass and not a lot else. Um, that's out there so for somebody who's like in a subdivision and they're trying to attract pollinators what are some strategies do you think that they could implement to help with that problem yeah um going back to what you said earlier first of all um i remember last year the garden where i grew we had some sunflowers like that and they were lesser goldfinch were the birds that yeah. really like the sunflowers and, you know, I'm an ornithologist by profession, and I just, when you talk about hedgerows, it reminds me of how they used to garden in the United States, too, where, you know, they were relatively small farms, you know, a few hundred acres maybe, and they were separated by um, by hedgerows or field, uh, field rows or whatever they call them. And, you know, I was involved in some studies where they showed that, you know, if you have a 40 or 50 wide a uh, foot wide patch between your fields, you can get 40 to 45 varieties of birds, and the number of bird varieties is is very much indicative of the complex complexity, the biodiversity. Whereas out in the fields, you get two varieties of birds, mm. and and um, you know the pollinators I think were a really good indication of biodiversity too. Again, the more biodiverse the place is then the healthier it is and the less problems you're going to have with, you know, aphids or any other kinds of, of 
of uh, disease or pest problems. So um, I, I think increasing the biodiversity by planting some native wildflowers, or they don't necessarily have to be native, but um, like one variety I've grown is Korean mint. And it's, uh, you know, one of those ancient Chinese, one of the top 50 herbs or whatever. And um, they're extremely attractive to all kinds of pollinators. You grow some dill, you grow some um, fennel, uh, any kinds of mints, um, you know, flowers of all kinds. They just bring in pollinators from everywhere. And it's not just the flowers. You need some habitat for them. You know, you need some uh, logs that you can drill some holes in or, or wood piles or wood chips or you know, a uh, dense patch of weeds on the edge or, you know, maybe maybe uh, some sandy areas where some of them can dig their holes. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can – I've got a book called Landscaping with Nature, and I I haven't followed much of it yet. But but if, if you know, if you or any of your listeners have ever been out in the woods, like in a meadow where mm. there's moisture and, and – you know, up in the mountains and there's trees around and grasses, sedges, uh, beavers, whatever. I mean, it's just so, to me, it just speaks to my soul that I'm part of this incredible diversity of life on this planet. And when I garden, I want to bring some of that to my backyard. And as I mentioned, my front yard is all plants. I've got 50 hills of cucumbers and squash and melons. And not one blade of grass. Of oh course, a weed patch when I got here. But I have no interest in growing grass mm -hmm. unless I have enough space where I can grow grass just for the purpose of cutting it to uh, produce material for my compost pile or to put around my plants. So grass itself isn't necessarily bad, but, but um, you know... Lawn mowers are the most polluting uh, engines that we use in the United States. And lawns, including especially golf courses, use the highest um, amount of herbicides and pesticides of any place in the U.S. I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, I know we grew up liking lawns and there's a place for it at parks. Mm -hmm. Throwing frisbees or whatever, running barefoot in the grass. I'm not saying we should go on a, a rampage, a war against all grass and lawns, but there's an organization, I think it's international with a number of chapters called Grow Food, Not Lawns. Yes. And, you know, there are towns who require, especially if you're in one of these, you know, uptight, high-end... Uh, HOAs. Yeah. There's CCCRs and all that where... You have to keep your grass between 1.34 inches and, and 2.17 inches tall, and you can't have this, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't do that. Sounds <laughs> like my neighbor. Yeah, I, you know, go move to Switzerland or something where, where people control you more. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a big movement to move away from it. I know there's, there's places out in Washington and Oregon where they they are actively encouraging people to ditch the grass and put in um vegetable gardens and there's um i get i think there's some kind of um subsidies that and grants that people can apply for to do that so that's that's kind of cool that things are changing yeah yeah it, you know forward thinking people are going are are thinking about their grandchildren and their great great grandchildren and what kind of legacy they're gonna leave mm -hmm. them. And um I don't know, that image of the white picket fence and a perfectly manicured lawn and I mean, I mean, you know, it's not ugly but it's sterile. And there's so much possibility if you improve your soil and get the right mm -hmm. amount of water and get your you know, your pH right and and, and get your microhabitats for all of these native pollinators and, and, and other plants and, you know, let some weeds grow a little bit around the edges, depending on the type of weed. I'm not sure I want Canada bull thistle, but you know what I'm saying? 
or or Russian thistle, which I've got a lot of here. Mm-hmm. That, that's not what I'm, I'm wanting anyway. It just just relax and and work with nature, and you know you can have so much more production per unit area if you're willing to take care of 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 the the property and work with nature and build a a small ecosystem i'm i mean i'm sure you're very familiar with uh some of the principles of of uh permaculture yeah and yeah, you say yeah yeah and so those are the kinds of things that you do uh to increase the beauty and productivity and and being a part of nature and you know people want to come to your place if it's a cool looking place yeah. you can get some shade trees that produce fruit you can get soft stuff under your feet mm-hmm. and you know you can get bumblebees and all kinds of native anyway yeah no no it's it, it's great and it's just like like you said there's just so many um possibilities that uh, you know in in having a garden and and one of the things i'm really curious by dale is you know like you're really known here in utah for tomatoes and like really big tomatoes in particular um you know but I, i'm really curious are tomatoes your favorite thing to grow um well i i really like tomatoes I, uh, you know, I, I published lists. I think I have, and I, I sent you a link to that where I have a list of my 162 favorite tomato varieties. Mm-hmm. And then, <laughs> and, if you guys listening, I'm going to put these links in the description of the podcast. Yeah. So you check those out because, I mean, I got lost looking at that list. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've I think I've got close to 2700 total varieties of tomatoes in my inventory. I don't have seeds of all of those yet. Um and probably easily 2000 of those I I would be glad to grow if I you know, I I'm just glad I don't have to choose only 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 20, my top 20 or whatever. Um so yeah, I really enjoy tomatoes. I I preserve them mostly through freezing. I've done some drying and some canning too so that I can have them all winter. Um, I enjoy trying different flavors and textures and colors and sizes and shapes and stripes and whites and yellows and multicolored and everything like that. It, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, I have to confess, though, that I've got a serious sweet tooth and I do like a good melon. So oh I've, I've tried growing about 100 and different, 120 or so different varieties of melons over the years got some really tasty melon varieties they're a little harder to grow especially this elevation and you know uh they take a little more space and things but yeah i um my tomatoes my big tomatoes the giant tomatoes is actually how i started out back in 2009 2010 um i won an online auction for some giant tomato seeds and I was amazed at how big they got. And oh, they were actually giant ones. Yeah, they they were from documented giant tomatoes that were like four pounds and three and a half pounds and things. And I'd never, hardly ever even seen a tomato over a pound, even though I've been growing, you know, since I was a kid. I just never saw big tomatoes, even though I would order seeds of so-called big tomatoes from the glitzy commercial seed catalogs i wasn't getting anything like they were predicting and you know i mentioned in 2014 is a year that i put like six to eight inches of my own compost in the soil Mm -hmm. and that was the year i broke the utah state record four times in one year oh my gosh so the the utah state record now stands at about 4.76 pounds i think Okay, you've got to share some tips in growing tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that link I sent you, I actually prepared a PowerPoint presentation that okay. I did at the gardening club a couple of, of months ago out in Tooele, or the Master Gardeners. And so it's got the whole PowerPoint presentation there. 
But basically, I'll, I'll run through it real quick. The the number one thing is getting your hands on some good genetics. You got to get the right seeds. Forget the glitzy commercial seed catalogs. That's not the place to get them. Um, get them from me. <laughs> <laughs> We'll make sure to put a link to where you can buy them because I, yeah. um, you've got some really interesting varieties that are available for sure. So uh, for the big tomatoes, um, uh, I, I guess I'm bragging a little bit. Can I do that? My yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I may have the world's most complete collection of of seeds of tomatoes that are supposed to get big, which is two pounds or more. And it's roughly 315 varieties. Oh my goodness! That that you has. Uh, I try to keep up on the big tomato list. That's what I call it. Mm-hmm. And I add um, somebody I've uh, traded seeds with for the last eight years or so. Send me another picture of breaking a record for a variety. So I acknowledge the biggest specimen of every variety that I know of in the world on that list. So there's over 300 varieties on there. And in case they taste good still, like do they, have, like do they still taste good? Because I know I know in the UK they had like giant vegetable growing competitions, like giant carrots, and of course there's Bill's Atlantic giant, you know, pumpkin that needs you know like five, I don't know, forklift trucks to move it. But they don't taste great. So I'm curious, do do the big tomatoes that you're growing, do they still taste good? Oh yeah, some of them taste very good. Um, on the giant pumpkins, um, I'm a member of the Utah Giant Pumpkin Growers also. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, we have our way off the last uh, Saturday in September at Thanksgiving Point every year. And I usually run the table um, where we deal with the tomatoes, the giant tomatoes, the giant uh, watermelons, cantaloupe. Uh, okay, beans. you and I are going to talk more off lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um so the Atlantic giant uh, pumpkin is definitely not worth eating. I've tried it. I've grown them several years. Um, but the giant tomatoes, most of them have the roots back in Italy. Oh. And, you know, in generations past, in fact, the new world's record is uh, of a variety that I helped name after a guy named Vincenzo Domingo. So the mm-hmm. variety is called Domingo. And they just set a world record about three weeks ago of 10 point seven eight pounds or something like that i'll need to look it up wow so that's one tomato of course it a fuse but um so as you may know uh italians primarily cook with their tomatoes mm-hmm. they take these big tomatoes you know you only need one of them to make a quart or two right and you cook it down for a couple hours and make wonderful sauce out of it um, if you were just to eat it off the vine, you know, some of them are a little bit on the watery side or slightly bland. But if you were to take a really intensely flavored tomato, like, uh, you know, some of these dark tomatoes, uh, Cherokee purple and so on, and cook those down for two hours in a sauce, it would just be too intense. You know, it'd be like eating tomato paste or so. It's just, it's just too strong for a sauce. But there are a lot of people, and not all, you know, these big tomatoes, each of them has their own unique flavor profile. I mean, I'm not saying you could give me a slice of a tomato and close, I'd close my eyes and I could tell you what variety it is. <laughs> Growing too many, you know, I grow up to 500 plus varieties a year, so I'm, I, I'm not very good at, at blind taste testing like that. But yeah, a lot of these big tomatoes, some of my customers, seed customers, some of their favorites are the big ones. Um, the first really tasty tomato that I grew back in 2008, 2009, the big one was Big Zach, and I was just amazed. It was juicy and sweet, and I'd never, even though I'd grown tomatoes for years, I'd never had one that tasted that good. Of course, I've grown a lot more since then that are even better in flavor, but yeah, it's, uh, it's quite, it's, it's a really fun sport. To grow these giant tomatoes but um you know back to the overview of how to grow them you got to start with the right seeds yeah. and then really good rich soil i mentioned all the compost mm-hmm. and then um the techniques uh you know you've got to use some mycorrhizal fungal spores in there and 
uh, probably some humates and some other uh, soil amendments because you really, really what you're doing is taking care of your of your um, um, soil biome. Yeah. You want lots and lots of, of, of good critters in there, the, the earthworms and and uh, neem the right nematodes and bacteria and fungi. You know, mm -hmm. you're feeding those roots as much as you can. And um, what you're trying to do is encourage these mega, mega blooms, which are fuse blossoms. And uh, those are the only ones that are going to give you, you know, it's very rare to get anything over to maybe three pounds from a single blossom. Um, so these giant varieties um, uh, have, will produce uh, some quantity of mega blooms or fused blossoms. And those are the ones you have to do some extra work pollinating them. Okay. Because the flowers tend to be kind of deformed, so you need to add more pollen to them. And you then you just go out there with a little paintbrush and give them a tickle, or? I use, uh, I use a little black plastic spoon and an electric okay. toothbrush, and I go around and collect pollen from other flowers, and then yeah, I use a little toothbrush and brush it onto the onto the um, stigmas of the of the mega bloom, and do okay. that two or three times a day for about four or five days. Oh wow, that's that's quite an operation. Yeah, if you want to get a really big one, you've got to give it lots and lots of pollen, and sometimes the different parts of the flower open on different days. And that's one of the reasons you got to be vigilant. In this hot weather we've had, though, I've lost every single mega bloom I've had. Yeah. You know, I've had hundreds of them, and they just dry up. And I just got my shade cloth up yesterday. Yeah. That's how long it took me to get my <laughs> truck. I just, I'm just so far behind. But, but yeah, I'm it, it's okay. Every year I get scalded tomatoes, and I'm like, yeah. next year I'll put shade cloth up, and I always forget. Yeah, well, shade cloth is one of the one of the factors I use. As you probably know, at this higher elevation um, along the Wasatch Front, you get about 20% more UV B rays, the ultraviolet B rays that uh, can damage plants and you know causes sunburn and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, so, compared to people who grow at sea level, you've got that you've got the ultraviolet rays to deal with, and the the tomato plants are at their maximal capacity for photosynthetic production at about 34% of natural sunlight. So if you get 30, 40, 50% shade cloth, yeah. they're doing just fine. They don't need that much sun. Kind of what a, sh a shade cloth does because the sun's slowly moving across the sky um, is it's like the sunlight blinks on and then blinks off, blinks on and blinks off. And so you don't have that intense sun heating up the the fruit or the or the plants all the time or the blossoms and so um you, you you know it just gives them an opportunity to cool off a little bit and to collect themselves metabolically and you're not going to get the sun scald and you're going to get a lot better fruit set and and i've done some experimentation well, well actually i should say some research um where tomatoes can go from blossom to ripe fruit in about an average of about 46 days during the heat of the summer. But if you use shade cloth, they can take 60 to 65, maybe 70 days, okay. which allows the fruits to grow bigger um, and better quality. And, um, you know, in the fall, of course, you don't want the shade cloth up, but. Right. Yeah. So. That's a good tip for people in the, the Southern states. I know I've got a lot of listeners in Texas and Florida and um, Alabama and California where, you know, they're getting, you know, a lot of a lot of heat, too. So is the shade cloth going to help with some of that offset as well? Absolutely. I, I usually grow at least some of my plants under a high tunnel, you know, the hoop house with the yep. PVC pipe structure, and, and I attach a shade cloth over that, and I can adjust the shade cloth as I need to depending on the time of the year. Um, the other thing, uh, I have not quite gotten this obsessive or my, uh, my biggest tomatoes would probably be more like six or seven pounds, but some of the giant pumpkin growers here in, in Utah actually will grow in a, in a greenhouse type setting and they install a misting system where the water will mist 
uh, sent out a, a mist about every, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And so the evaporative cooling effect keeps the temperatures down because these giant pumpkins don't like 95, 100, 105 degree heat. They yeah. like it, you know, around 80, 85. Oh. And that's the ideal temperature for tomatoes too. As, as I'm sure you know, it's between 70 degrees and 85 degrees roughly is the ideal temperature for growing tomatoes. And in many parts of Utah and, and, you know, the states you mentioned, Florida, Texas, Arizona, and so on. Um, you hit, I mean, I mean, I have, uh, a brother who lives in the Phoenix area and he said there's some nights that it does not get below a hundred degrees. Oh. And I don't know how you grow. I mean, I've got a list of heat tolerant tomatoes on that le- link I sent you, but, um, you know, a missing system taking advantage of the, of the evaporative cooling system, if you're willing to put in the time and effort and of course a little bit of money in building a structure you could do you could set up a misting system that would help to keep it cool and i've thought about that for a long time and just haven't done it because i've been moving around so much but you know that's one idea but a shade cloth will do probably 70 percent of that kind of work of keeping the you know it's not going to necessarily reduce the air temperature but it's going to keep the the plants themselves from getting too hot. I, I mean, the sun beating down on it. I mean, we anybody that's grown peppers in this at this elevation has had the sun's called on on bell peppers, mm-hmm. and that's one of the reasons it's best to grow bell peppers at least in partial shade or real dense and encourage lots of foliage because it'll reduce the sun's call. But if you grow them under under uh, shade cloth, you're not going to have any sun scald at all. That's that's a really, really, really good tip. Um, Because I always get asked a lot of questions about how do I I stop some of these things happening. And, you know, I've I've been really complacent in in doing that for the garden just because I grow, you know, I've got like a lot of arches, like cattle panel arches between raised beds. So I often get a lot of shade as the sun moves into different areas to different parts of the garden get shade but you know I've got some friends that are in the southern states who are like hey um my like you know pepper's pre-cooked itself um how do I (laughs) mitigate that and some of the strategies like I've heard people are you know saying is grow on the east side of the property because then on the afternoon you know you'll get some respite from that sun and then other people say go on the west side because then you get you know a little bit of respite during you know the early mornings and stuff but it's really that some shade cloth is going to be a whole lot easier than trying to kind of figure out where to grow things in in the yard yeah and um you know a lot of people are grateful for some shade trees around the edges of their gardens Mm -hmm. you know whether it's east west west or south of course, north isn't going to shade much, but um, the problem with those is that they produce shade in the evening mm-hmm. or in the morning, and that's when you need the sun. Yeah. And the most important sunlight is for coming up first thing in the morning. So growing on the east is is a good idea. But if you put up shade cloth, then, um, you know, you've got shade in the middle of the day when it's needed the most. Yeah. Um, and, and so... You know, you can you can build a structure with hoops or even just with some poles driven in the ground. PVC uh, piping. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, teeth posts aren't going to be tall enough, but you can go to a metal recycling facility and get, like, these 10-foot pole, um, you know, sturdy steel poles, or even uh, metal conduit pipe that they use for electrical conduit. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, what I've done is take a, you know, maybe a three foot piece of rebar and drive it in the ground and ream it out as I go to make a hole and then pull the rebar out and pound the the pole into there and then you know you can use some loop ties or some some twine or something to tie the tie the uh shade cloth to that. There's it, it just there's a lot of a lot of different things. I mean you can use some scrap lumber or whatever but shade cloth 
Yeah, shade cloth really helps in this elevation. And my experience is it needs to go up by June 15th and come down around September 15th. So you got about three months where you really, um, your garden can really benefit from shade cloth. Now, your melons, especially watermelon and okra and some other, uh, you know, eggplant kind of, but okra and melons like it really hot. I mean, they should do real well in Phoenix, 100, 105, 110. You know, these are really heat-loving plants, and so you don't really need shade cloth for those. But most everything else that you grow could benefit from it. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that tip, Dale. That's that's great. Now, i got to ask you um, about pruning and tomatoes and, and what your stance on, on that is. Yeah, there's, ones. yeah, I'm sure you've come across a lot of controversy of pruning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I know I've seen websites years ago where they say, oh, you're – tomato plant only needs four leaves and so if you have any more than that you're wasting energy and putting it in you know you need to let it go into fruit um well first of all i'm going to say that if you're growing cherry tomato plants you're utterly wasting your time pruning them because they'll produce with or without pruning um if you're growing determinate plants you know the ones that only get maybe three feet high yeah um, it's very counterproductive to to prune those because they pretty much put all their fruit out in one batch and then they're done. So they're also known as patio tomatoes, right? Yeah, patio tomatoes, some of those dwarf determinants, and so on. And um, but the majority of varieties that I grow, and and in my opinion, most of them that have fruit that's really tasty are indeterminate varieties, many of them heirlooms, and some of these plants can easily grow 15 to 20 feet tall in one season if you give them some good soil and keep them evenly watered. And uh, they can pr produce literally hundreds of tomatoes. I mean, you can get 50 pounds, 40, 50 pounds off of one plant. Um, uh, what... So it depends a lot upon the variety and upon your soil. If you have really good, rich soil, I think you should uh, let the tomato vines grow. Um, because I usually grow in, in uh, limited space, I usually try to grow, like especially in a high tunnel, which is like premium real estate for me. Yep. I usually prune to just two stems. I take the main stem and then at the first major fork i'll keep that first sucker mm -hmm. and, and i'll tie them up that way oh. and and i'll prune there's a modified um there's a modified pruning method where you let the sucker grow to maybe four to six inches so it'll put out um a, a set of leaves and then you pinch off the, the tip of the sucker and just grow uh the one main stem or two main stems um but I've talked to some people who are serious tomato growers that grow for market. You yeah. know, they're interested in pounds per acre. Yeah, yeah. And they don't prune. They don't prune at all. Oh, really? Even and, like the indeterminate variety? That's right. They just let wow. them grow and grow, and they swear that they get better production. Now, this is uh, somebody I know from the Midwest with some really good soil, and they're not losing all these blossoms and things. Um, here, uh, uh, because of foliage diseases, I think it's important to keep your tomatoes tied up and never, ever do overhead watering if you can help it. You know, a sprinkler system and a tomato patch do not mix well at all. Um, but it's a good idea as you get well into June and early July to prune off the lower leaves to get some air circulation and to keep the leaves off the soil. Mm -hmm. And that'll help um, reduce the chance of, of foliar diseases. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, it depends on your goal for giant tomatoes. If you're growing big tomatoes and you need to do a lot of pruning and a lot of thinning, so you're getting one or maybe two big tomatoes per plant. So not very efficient. The energy into yeah. into those instead. 
cool. But if you if you want good production, you start with really good soil. Make sure you set up to have a good um, a good trellising system, and uh, do minimal pruning. The guy that set the world's record, Charles Wilbur, um, uh, he averaged 345 pounds per plant, Whoa. and he did, yeah, he did some pruning, but it was to 18 stems per plant. And the only reason he did that is because the diameter of the of the hog wire or, or uh, livestock fencing that he made his cylindrical um, trellis system with, he he it had 18 wires on it, and so he had one stem per wire, and he pruned off everything else. Got it. And, and these plants were getting 20, 25 feet tall, so he had a scaffold built around them. Nice. So I'm going to make sure I'm going to put the link to um, your brief guide to growing uh ginormous tomatoes um in the description so those listeners that are really intrigued by growing uh massive tomatoes and maybe getting in on some of these uh competitions can check that out now you mentioned some uh diseases and problems with um tomatoes and i i hope you've got a little bit of time that maybe to talk us through some of those common common problems so i know New gardeners always talk about blossom end rot being a disease, and I mean, I I know that it's not actually a disease; it's a it's a nutrient problem. Um, but blight is also another uh, big problem that people seem to face with tomatoes. Yeah, um, a, a few years ago, I I did some serious research into blossom end rot because I had really good rich soil, I had good seeds, I thought I was taking good care of my plants and and um you know there may be some differences of opinion with this but this is this is what I came up with with my research okay um uh you know the blossom end rot is a physiological disorder and what's happening is at the blossom end of the tomato um if you don't get enough calcium to that area then um, the cell walls start to break down and it'll start with a little brown spot and then it'll gradually spread and then it'll dry out and cake and the tomato will quit growing. Well, what happens is the delivery system for calcium to the ends of those fruits is is uh, not really effective, not really efficient sometimes, especially if you have elongated, the prolate fruits like some of your Roma types. Yeah. Um, those are more prone to blossom end rot, and, and some of the bigger ones that grow real fast are susceptible to, to blossom end rot too. So if you understand the physiology of the plants at the root level in particular, um, the fine feeder roots of tomato vines are only in the top inch, maybe two inches of soil. And our native soils here are fairly alkaline. Yeah, and they so are. If your pH is, you know, 7, 7.2, 7.4, calcium is going to be a really limiting uh, nutrient um, because at the root level, it's competing with other cations like um, magnesium and and uh, iron and so on for those uh, uptake sites of the roots. So what you need to do is make sure that First of all, the native soils have plenty of calcium. You don't need to add calcium to your mix unless you're doing grow beds or something. If you're growing in even 20% native soil, you've got plenty of calcium, generally speaking. Um, so you need to keep that top inch or two of soil moist and, you know, not soggy because that can be just as much of a problem, but keep them moist. And I know some people have written or said, you should water tomatoes once a week and water them deeply to get those roots going down deep. Well, if you're buying into that, that is an absolute certain recipe for blossom end rot because you're going to get um, you're going to get that top inch of soil drying out. So um, on a hot, windy day, especially, you'll notice um, within a day or two after that is where you'll start getting some blossom end rot. Yeah. So my idea ideally would be to take like those uh, sprinkler heads and put out a fine mist and turn them upside down about 15 inches off the soil 
and have them spray um, the, of course, this is after you remove the lower leaves, but have them spray the surface of the soil um, at least every two days, maybe more often than that if it's real dry. And a really good organic mulch on the surface will help. But you need to keep that, you know, tomatoes are not a wetland species, but they're a moist land species. They don't like um, drying out. If you have good drainage, you almost cannot water tomatoes too much. Again, most of us have heavy clay soil, so it's easy to water them too much. But you're much better off, at least where I'm at in Utah, um, uh, you're much better off watering three or four times a week. Um, you know, maybe a half inch, an inch at a time, depending on the heat and the wind, than you are watering once a week. This may not apply to people in other parts of the world or in other parts of the country where they get a lot of rain. They may need to apply some uh, some calcium. But here in Utah, um, we really have plenty of calcium. It's just a matter of, of that the, those feeder roots drying up, shriveling up, and not being able to take up the calcium they need. So get your soil pH down around 6.2 to 6.8, roughly 6.5 if you can, mm -hmm. and you'll, you know, your calcium uptake will be much, much more efficient. Oh. So the big problem is a combination of high pH and letting the top so top layer of soil dry out. Dry out. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, what can happen when things get too moist. So, you know, other parts of the country get a lot of rainfall. They have a lot of humidity. Um, certainly in the UK, blight was a huge problem with tomatoes. We could never grow them outside. It was always in a greenhouse to kind of protect them from from the blight. So, what what tips do you have for that? Yeah, well, first of all, there's uh, I think there. I don't remember the scientific name, but there's uh, the early blight and the late blight. Mm -hmm. um, the early blight is usually not too much of a problem because it comes earlier in the year and it the summer comes, dries out. It's the late blight that can be absolutely devastating. And those fungal spores um, are just in the air in moist areas, and they they come in and settle on the leaves, and you can literally wipe out your entire tomato patch in two weeks. And I'm sure you've heard horror stories about that or seen it yourself. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, there are some uh, – there's been some research done out in North Carolina, for example, where they have a big problem with soil-borne diseases and, and blight, where they will take a uh, – take a root – they'll do grafting with tomatoes and graft like a luscious heirloom variety on top of a rootstock of a of a – of a resistant variety. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to help much with blight. Um, a good hygiene in your garden is important for blight. Um, I know some people in areas with heavy rainfall, they will actually uh, put up a glass or plastic structure, even if it's not a greenhouse and grow in grow bags or raised beds so that they're not getting the soggy you know, the the soggy roots, you know, get them up at least a foot or so off the ground. Mm. And if you, can, uh, uh, if you can grow them under some kind of plastic, keep the rain off. Um, there are some, uh, of course, there are some chemical fungicides that are are pretty good at preventing blight. But once it's inside the plant, you, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, and then there's, uh, let's see, I think there, there's some combinations of like baking soda, but that's real risky because you can kill the plants with that. Um, I think there's some sulfur and, uh, some other powder treatments that you can use as a preventative, um, but if you talk to an extension agent, they're just going to tell you to to uh, to grow some of these um, commercial hybrid varieties that have uh, some resistance to blight. And I don't really get into the commercial hybrids very much, so I don't really have much knowledge of that. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, in my experience, growing in the high desert, I've had very little problem with blight, and so I'm not probably the best person to talk to about that. I've seen these heirloom varieties easily outproduce many of these hybrid varieties that are touted to be so disease resistant and, and stuff. So I'm I'm not sold on the superiority of hybrids, but but um, I would recommend for people who live in an area with uh, real problems with the blights that maybe they take the advice of their extension agent or equivalent person and maybe maybe stick with some of these more resistant varieties in the future. Yeah, at least until they can get a handle on how their garden's growing and then maybe expand into some other varieties to try. And yeah. you, know, you might get a surprise that works even better than a resistant variety. Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, you know, another common disease I, I've had a lot more problem with is curly top virus. But one similarity here, I mean, the vector is uh, the beet leaf hopper. And these beet leaf hoppers can fly for hundreds of yards at a time, and so you can't spray and expect to kill them because you know you have to spray an, an entire county at once to control them. Yeah. And so, kind of like the spores for blight, um, they're just everywhere. They're ubiquitous, and you you can't spray and expect to get rid of the spores or get rid of the leaf hoppers, and so. Um, yeah, the leaf hoppers have, have caused, I've lost as much as 85% of my, my entire tomato crop to, um, curly top virus in one year. Oh, oh, Dale, that's, that's awful. <laughs> yeah, well, I figured oh, out how to prevent it. How? Not with pesticides. Um, when you understand the life cycle of these, of these little buggers, the, uh, beet leaf hoppers as as you probably know they only have to feed for a minute or less on a plant and infect mm-hmm. it with the virus oh yeah and then that plant is you know gets yellow and crinkled and it's pretty much dead within two weeks it, it's useless you pull it up and burn it or whatever but um if you understand the life cycle and and when this particular species of Leaf hopper, you know, they, they fly around in these little swarms in hot, dry air, you know, in hot, dry weather, especially like from, I don't know, late May to early July, and then they're done swarming. And they like wide open agricultural areas in particular, but they can get in backyard gardens. And they, they focus in on little green patches in the middle of dry areas, which is exactly what your young seedlings are. So what you do is use um, uh, use row cover, like a remake fabric or something like that, Got and it. secure that over the plants. Um, I've done little mini, like, low tunnels with this fabric and secure it down, and the very next year I had 15% instead of 85% mortality. And that fifteen percent was all where the fabric kept blowing off. Oh wow, that's a so huge you, difference. Yeah, if you if you grow under the fabric until like the first or second week of July, then you can take it off and you'll have these big beautiful plants. They will have benefited from um, you know, a little extra heat and protection from other mm-hmm. bugs and stuff. And uh I I was just it was just like night and day when I used this roll cover fabric. So it's just a barrier for that particular pest. Yeah. No, it, th- that's a great thing because I, I didn't even think of that. And it's, it's funny because when I had an allotment back in England, um, you would put like little things of, of row cover in between your carrots. And one of the popular things was um, using like an old pair of ladies' tights. Um, oh, gosh, what do you call them over here? Um, N- nylon stockings. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And you'd kind of like stretch those like across because, you know, the the carrot fly was pretty low flying. And if you were, um, you know, thinning out your carrots, the smell attracted them really quickly. So you'd grow them, um, you know, nearby some onions and stuff, which kind of disrupt that smell. But, yeah, using a fabric barrier was, you know, one of those methods that worked the best, really, for uh, preventing them damaging your carrots. So, yeah, that's, that's a great tip. Oh my gosh, Dale, you're just 
full of these golden nuggets of gardening advice. Well, you know, I've re- I did I've never dealt with carrot flies, but um, there's a similar method that they use with or uh, with apples in orchards and the coddling moth and other pests on the apples. So these organic growers will buy these little um, nylon uh, anklets or footsies or whatever they're called. You know, they just they just go up to your ankles. And they'll buy them by the thousands and go out at the uh, when the apples are, you know, about the size of a quarter. And they'll get up on their ladders and prune off the the other blossoms to just keep the biggest one in the middle and put this little um, nylon stocking around it. And they have um, a 90 to 95 plus percent protection against coddling moth and, and fruit flies and so on. And the tomato, the, the apples will grow into those stockings yeah. and and they get these big, beautiful, blemish-free apples and they're certified organic. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. You just literally blown my mind because coddling moth has been a real problem for me in my, my orchard this year. And, I mean, I didn't want to do the grease banding or anything like that because I've got a puppy and she's just really interested in everything and I'm you know she's just eating everything um so I didn't want to have like anything like that where she was going to be you know tearing it off the tree so okay now now I know what my next random amazon orders yeah and if those are a little pricey for you something that's cheaper that i use all the time for covering my blossoms is these little um little baggies that they use for wedding gift bags i think the fabric is organza or organza or something like that and you can get them at different sizes and just cinch those up and they may not be quite as effective but you know, you can reuse them and they're relatively cheap and they hold up okay to the weather. And you can color coordinate them. <laughs> yeah, or get a whole bunch of different colors and take there pictures. You go, there you go. So this variety of apples going to get the pink ones. These pears are going to get the purple ones. And maybe this one over here is going to get the gold ones because that one's special. Oh, my gosh. That was that's, that's brilliant tip. That's yeah, a it's tip. If you're a serious gardener and you've got the time, you know, there's all kinds of cool little tricks like that that you can do. And, uh, you know, finding the time is a real big issue for a lot of us. Yeah, for for sure. I mean, you know, I I mean, I, I work full time, you know, during during the week. And, you know, I, I make time for the garden because it's something that I really enjoy to do. Um I don't know that I would make time necessarily to individually cover a blossom, but I might try it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned that you use this landscape fabric, you know, mm. the porous landscape fabric. And I mentioned that uh, weeds are the bane of my existence. Well, that landscape fabric, even though it's a little bit pricey, if you get the good quality stuff, that can go a long ways to reducing yeah. the amount of weeding that you have to do. It may not be totally effective against bindweed, but... Most of the other weeds can be held at bay with that, especially if you put some wood chips or something on top of it. Yeah, for for sure. It's it's definitely reduced everything a lot. Um and you know, it's it's a huge difference between the areas that don't have it and those that do. I mean, yeah, I've got like quite a cluster of some random thistles that I found when I was out barefoot um earlier today. Um, but it's you know, it, from what it was to what it is now, like there's so so fewer fewer weeds. Um, so I I'm conscious of of time for you, and I just wondered if you'd um maybe give um a couple of last tips for some new gardeners, and um, maybe share um where they can um, find out more about delectation of tomatoes and get a hold of some seeds and try their hand at, at growing something new. Sure, that that sounds great. Um, for beginning gardeners, uh, don't even think about taking a tiller and just tilling up your backyard and throwing some seeds in there. Unless you live in the Midwest or, you know, a place with some rich native soil, you're going to be utterly dis- 
disappointed, discouraged, and probably quit after your first season. So really, really think about putting in a lot of organic matter. Organic matter takes care of soil that's excess in clay, soil that's excess in sand, soil that's depleted of nutrients, soil that's high pH, soil that's low pH. I mean, there's other things that you can do. But if you can um, get up to 20, 25% organic matter in your soil through some good, uh, rich, well-aged compost, um, you've done half your work already. And if you're going to grow tomatoes, uh, don't overhead water. Water by hand with a watering wand or a drip system is especially good if you're, if you're interested in conserving the water. And, um, of course, um, getting some good seeds is very important. I'm trying to encourage people to save, uh, seeds of some of these rare varieties. Yeah. I could start rattling off a whole list of them, but I'll spare you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, um so my website is delectationoftomatoes.com and of course delectation is not a really commonly used word it just means it comes from the same root as delicious or delectable or delicatessen that means just enjoyment of tomatoes. So delectationoftomatoes.com or GiantTomatoSeeds.com, and I have uh, a, a website that's in progress. <laughs> it's not great, but it's fully functional, and you're always welcome to email me with any questions. You know, if you're looking for extra early varieties, extra tasty varieties, heat tolerant varieties, super productive, super cool looking, or whatever, um, it's Dale at GiantTomatoSeeds.com. So D A L E at giant tomato seeds with an s dot com and i'm um i often don't get to my email until after dark for obvious re reasons um um i don't do any social media at all because i don't have time for it and um i'm focused on my garden <laughs> producing seeds and and uh having fun that way and um one last thing is gardening is cheaper than therapy. For sure, for sure. And one thing I did want to make sure that you did mention was about your business card. Oh, yes. Um, yes, I um, I go to farm conferences and gardening, gardening, you know, seed exchanges and things like that all the time. And I hand out a business card everywhere I go. And it's just a a packet of seeds, usually tomato seeds, with some information on the back. And, you know, I encourage people to grow those or share them with other people. And, you know, I'm kind of old fashioned. I believe that the, the best way to grow a business is, um, word of mouth and good quality and good customer service, not necessarily by tons of advertising. So I've got my ideas about that. But anyway, um, if you, uh, I, for anybody who listens to this blog, I've, um, I've set up a, uh, under, under seeds and I, I sent you the link for this. Yeah, for I'll make sure it. Promotion code. I've got a link there for a, a free sample packet, which is my business card. When you include the promotion code, um, in the note to sell or by email, you can use the promotion code misfit gardener and i'll just send you a free pack of seeds no charge and um you know of course you're more than welcome to order some others but this is just a way to get the word out there this is just you know it's just me doing this i don't resell seeds to any other seed sellers and i don't um sell any seeds that anybody else grows it's just a one person operation and so Again, this is, I'm kind of stuck in the old uh, artisan mode from pre-industrial revolution. <laughs> and and <laughs> that's just, that's just kind of the, that just kind of fits my philosophy of, of gardening. So, yeah. Just fine, Dale. Yeah. So, yeah, just enter Misfit Gardener. I'll be glad to send anybody a free sample. And I usually get those out within a day or two. Awesome. I will make sure to hook all that up into 
um, the description and also into the blog post that will go with this episode so people can uh, reach out and get hold of you. Thank you so much, Dale. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to be here with us and sharing all those um, I mean, I can't think of anything else to say other than like gold nuggets of information. Like that, that was just, I mean, you blew my mind and I've been gardening for a while, but that goes to show, you know, you learn something every day when you got grow a garden. Well, I appreciate it, Emma. I'm, I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you and I hope that your listeners will find something useful here. And I hope our cross, our paths will cross maybe at a, a seed exchange or something like that down the road here. For sure. I'm definitely saving a lot of seed to, to share um, in the next year or so. So that'll be great. Make sure that you check out those links in the podcast description uh, to get hold of all that information that Dale was talking about. And if you want to get hold of Dale's business card, uh, I will make sure to put the details down there as well. Until next time, I hope your garden grows beautifully. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.